Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Music That, Music that Makes a Difference. I'm Christy Kotek, the Director of Alumni Engagement, and I'm also a Roosevelt alum. And we're so happy that you all joined us today. We have the amazing, wonderful Paul Werdico here to discuss some of the songs and artists that help make an impact on modern society. He's going to present music examples. He shared some of them with me, and I'm very excited about this next hour. And he's going to examine their importance and their influence, and also try to weave in some of his unique curriculum that blends both music and social justice. Um, and for those of us, friends of the university who are joining, social justice is very aligned with our university's mission. Um, before I formally introduce Paul, I'd like to share just a couple reminders. Again, if you can kindly um, just keep your mic, mited, mic, your, mic, your mic muted throughout the webinar, um, that would be appreciated. That's just to help to ensure that we have the best quality for all. As I shared, Paul's going to be sharing some music examples, so we want to make sure everyone can tune in and hear. Um, but you can certainly feel free to ask questions throughout the hour. So go ahead and use the chat box. Um, we're going to do our best to answer all of the questions and as many as possible throughout the hour. So you don't wait, need to wait to the end. If you have a question, go ahead and type it in and we'll get to it as soon as possible. So now I have the very difficult task of introducing the legend, Paul Werdico. Um, I ho hope that all, you had the, all of you had the chance to read his bio or visit, um, the visit his website. It's very hard to narrow down his extensive list of accomplishments and, and contributions, um, but I'm gonna do my best. So Paul is hailed in, in the press as one of the most versatile and musical drummers in music today. He was a member of the Pat Metheny Group from 1983 to 2001. Um, and during that time, he won seven Grammy Awards. He has played with countless artists as has performed in all 50 states and over 60 countries. I feel like that could be a webinar in, in and of itself. Um, Paul has also played drums and percussions on hundreds of recordings. Um, he is also an associate professor of jazz studies at Roosevelt University's um, Chicago College of Performing Arts. And for over four decades, he's conducted drum master classes, clinics, workshops around the world, and has written educational articles and numerous magazines. Um, Paul's ground groundbreaking drum instructional book, Turn the Beat Around, was published by Alfred Music in 2017. So Paul, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Christy, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm going to go to a slideshow now, so you won't see me for a while until maybe the end, okay? Because I have so much music to play, so many things to talk about. Uh, like I was explaining earlier, this could easily go on for hours, but we're going to try to keep it down, you know, to the scheduled one hour. So I'm going to share my screen now, and uh, we'll start. Okay, can everyone see that? Okay. So here's the classes I'm, I taught and am teaching uh, this semester as well at Roosevelt University. It's based on social justice. Uh, mainly it's for non-music majors, even though music majors can take it. Um, this semester I came up with a new class called The Power of Black American Music. So, we're, you know, we're going to be talking about not just music, but the whole cultural social justice, the background. And in fact, all five of these classes I've come up with um, this, the first four, especially social justice through sound, rock music, its role in society, exploring the blues, and then making an understanding of jazz. And in these classes, we look at music, but since it's for non-music majors, it's not necessarily about music theory as much as it is about familiarizing people with, with the great art of, uh, you know, the great artists, the great music, where it comes from, why it exists, because that's, that's the thing, is that music just usually doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's just not theory, but it's also, um, there's a reason for its existence, and that's what we look into. And it's kind of amazing how many of uh, my students really love the classes, but also they had no idea of any of these things. So I'm wondering some of the things I'm gonna show you, how familiar you'll be with it. So here we go. So I guess the first question would be, can music really make a difference? And because sometimes people talk about music 
as um, you know, that musicians should just be musicians, you know, and not talk about politics. But since music and musicians have a bully pulpit, it's so many of us feel that we need to, to give us a voice. And since we have the chance to actually be heard by more than, than just our families and our close friends, it really, I think to me, it, it's almost a responsibility to actually go out and, and try to, you know, share what we actually believe in. And sometimes people, as we'll look at, sometimes the messages can get lost. Some people say that music actually does not really have any difference at all. But look at this next slide. This is Martin Luther King saying, music and singing played a critical role in inspiring, mobilizing, and giving voice to the civil rights movement. The freedom songs are playing a strong and vital role in our struggle, Martin Luther King during the uh, Albany movement said they gave the people new courage and a sense of unity. And then the great, uh, I mean, one of the greatest probably artists uh, in folk music, but it, just in general, Pete Seeger said, it's not how good a song is that matters, it's how much good a song actually does. So let me just play you two things. You might be familiar with these. I'm not gonna play you too much of it. Um, but here's a song called We Shall Overcome. Okay, so I don't know how many people know the background of this song because, you know, we think of the civil rights movement, but actually We Shall Overcome is a gospel song. It began as a protest song and a key anthem of the civil rights movement. And the song is most commonly attributed to being lyrically ascended from a song called I Will Overcome Someday, which was a hymn by uh, Charles Albert Tindley, first published in 1900. So I don't know how many people actually knew that because a lot of times, um, for me, one of the joys of being a teacher, but just being a musician and just being a human being in general is to research where everything comes from. Um, because without knowing that, sometimes you just kind of assume that um, something has a certain meaning or this is the first song by an artist or whatever and really without looking deeper and deeper we really don't understand the meaning of so many of these things so he talks about this um i'm not going to be able to play this there's not much time but he talks all about that's peak singer he talks all about the background on this okay now here's another song i should play you some of this video um you can see this this is from the obama administration and this is a song called this land is your land so I'm sure most people know this song again as sort of a positive song, but This Land Is Your Land is actually, um, it's, first of all, it's one of the most famous folk songs, and it, but it was written by um, you know, Woody Guthrie in 1940, and it was based on an existing melody that the Carter family tune had uh, when the world's on fire, but it was in a critical response to Irving Berlin's God Bless America. So, um, when he wrote this song, he got tired of hearing Kate Smith sing God Bless America on the radio. So actually what he did, um, let, me, let me play a little bit of this. You can see the difference in vibe. And so this is Woody Guthrie singing. You'll see Bruce Springsteen. You'll see um, President Obama. This is such a positive video. I'll just play part of it. But you'll see some of the lyrics. These are some of the lyrics that people don't know, especially the fifth and sixth verse. I was walking that ribbon of highway. As I went walking that ribbon of highway, so I saw the lightning in the sky. Redwood. 
There's George Lucas. I'm going to play the entire song because the next three verses aren't as well known. I love this. Check this neck. This is great. That's a great lyric. I'll stop it there. So if I go to the next slide, this is um, Woody Guthrie's actual uh, writing. This is his manuscript when he wrote out the song. And look at look, the title, it said, God Blessed America, okay? So sometimes what happens, sometimes the messages can, can get lost. So I'll be interested to see how many of you knew about this. So. There's a, a word called mondegreen. And I don't know if a lot of people actually know this, but it's a misunderstood or misinterpreted word or key phrase resulting from a mishearing of lyrics in the song. Okay. So like the example would be, excuse me while I kiss the sky versus excuse me while I kiss this guy. Sometimes people hear it one way or the other. And that, that's different than a mal, uh, mal, malaparism. Uh, which is just, you know, hearing a, a word uh, and, and saying it wrong, like dance the flamingo instead of dance the flamenco. So what happens a lot of times with these songs, sometimes the power of them or the message gets distorted or it just gets misunderstood or the words aren't clear. I mean, literally on that last one uh, that I just showed, this land was made for you and me, I actually wrote out those words as, as Pete Singer uh, sang them because I've seen so many different ways that they've been interpreted. And usually it's a very positive thing. They don't talk about people being hungry. They don't talk about the song. I've heard this, the, the sign saying no trespassing instead of private property. So sometimes things kind of get lost. So here's a clear example of a tune that some of you might not know, or some of you may know, but it's, there's a word in here that is the most important word in the whole song and it got, gets lost.
Now see if you can hear this last word. So if you hear hold your head up, whoa, or hold your head up, hold them, or whatever, the complete meaning gets lost because this song is actually a feminist anthem, which when in 1973, the, you know, it wasn't easy to get the lyrics. So I think a lot of people, including myself, had no idea. I love this song, but I always just sang along and I made up that last word thinking that it might have just been either a nonsense word or I usually, you know, hold your head high, hold them. Now here's another interesting thing. The Monkees, Last Train to Clarksville. Let me just play a second of this for those that you might not know. Okay, so that song, The Monkees, for those of you that might not know, were sort of America's answer to the Beatles. They had a, a hit radio, a television show for two years. But it's often been presumed that Clarksville, there was a, an Air Force base outside of Clarksville, Tennessee. So some people thought that this was actually a song about going to the Army base in Clarksville. But uh, the, the, one of the songwriters, Bobby Hart, actually says it wasn't, and they, they were just looking for a name that sounded good. So sometimes things you get, the, the meaning gets missed. Sometimes it gets mean, misinterpreted, and then sometimes someone else comes up with like a meaning that wasn't really the meaning. Okay, so the next, even incendiary songs uh, sometimes get used for commercial purposes. So I'll just play you something really quickly. Um, My Generation by The Who was from 1965, you know, and the lyrics, you know, hope I die before I get old. But what happens a lot of times with songs that even have a strong meaning, all of a sudden they get watered down. They end up on television commercials. They end up, you know, I've seen songs that I used to love be in car commercials and shampoo commercials. Here's just one example. I won't play a lot of it, but you can see what happens with this. So to be used in an iPod commercial, I guess they got um, permission because one of the ways that musicians can actually make money is by licensing. And so a lot of times, if you have a song and it gets into a movie or it gets into a commercial, you can make a lot of money. Sometimes things get watered down. In fact, I remember um, when the Apple catalog of the Beatles was up for grabs, Paul McCartney was friends with Michael Jackson, and he just happened to mention to Michael Jackson that he was going to buy the Apple catalog, and Michael Jackson outbid him and bought 
the Apple catalog. And the difference especially was that Paul McCartney and the Beatles did not want their songs used in commercials. And I remember being in Japan right after that happened. And all of a sudden I saw a, a car commercial in Japan and they were using one of the Beatles songs. And I was like, wow. So it's a way to, for income, but it also kind of ruins the messages in a, in a way. <laughs> So here's another thing. I'm going to look at a couple different styles of music. I'm kind of racing through this, but there's so much to cover. So, okay, so jazz and calls for social justice and change. Um, and sometimes, you know, sometimes the music is just too co controversial for the establishment. So here, the great Charles Mingus, um, he had a song called um, Fables of Fathers, okay? And I'll tell you all about it later on as I play it. Um, but there were two versions of it. And in 1959, he was on Capitol Records, or Columbia Records, and they would not let him use the lyrics. So here's the song a little bit without any lyrics. <laughs> I'll stop it there. So, you know, it's a, it's a great song instrumentally. It sounds a little bit like a Pink Panther theme. But the year later, in 1960, Charles Mingus got on Candid Records. So he left Columbia and he's with Candid, and he was actually able to put on his version of it. There's the lyrics and the video are on here. And when he says the, the, uh, Danny or Danny Richmond, that's his drummer. So I'll play you this. And it's so funny, the announcement at the front is, is kind of, uh, it's just Charles Mingus doing this funny announcement. play a little bit more of this Eric Dolphy's saxophone solo. So I'll stop it there. So hey, Paul, this, oh, Paul, 
real quick, we had a question come in um, from sure. Brittany Gunlack just about the music. She said, doesn't mean to sound naive, but was this release primarily in the South or nationwide? This, this recording was, it's like everywhere. It was recorded everywhere. And it was released. I mean, Columbia Records is, you know, was one of the biggest uh, record labels. And Candid was smaller, but he had total rights to do what he wanted on that. So it was available. I actually had this record. Good question. Okay. So that's one example. Now, here's another example. Okay, Strange Fruit. So some of you might know this song. I won't play the whole thing, but Billie Holiday recorded this song. And in some ways, Time Magazine actually named this song Song of the Century, believe it, you know, which is amazing. And it actually kind of affected her career because the label didn't want to put it out. And once this came out, a lot of her white, you know, fans were offended. And there was an individual who was the uh, Federal Bureau of Narcotics Commissioner. His name was uh, Harry Anslinger. And he was a known racist. And he believed that drugs caused black people to overstep their boundaries in American society. And that black singers who smoked marijuana created the devil's music. So I'll just play you a second of this because this is such a, you know, uh, it's such an amazing piece of work. So this was a song about lynching. And in a lot of ways, uh, this kind of got the word out to people that didn't know uh, that this was happening. And so it's such an important song. And it really, it, it, in some ways, it you know, immortalized her. She was one of the greatest uh, jazz singers, of course. But also, like I said, it really, it, she paid a price for recording this. And a lot of times, I mean, when people we're going to look at some other people later on. Sometimes when you dare to state something that, you know, the establishment or the popular media, you know, don't want you to talk about or feel that, you know, you have to, if you're popular, you have to kind of toe the line and just make money for them. If you overstep your bounds, it can cost you your career. So the people that do that are actually, you know, they're artists as opposed to just, you know, entertainers. Hey, Paul, another question came in sure. um, from John McDougall. Do you think that a song that became a standard that many people know has more power than something like Fabulous that was not that well known versus something like Strange Fruit? I'm not sure if I understand exactly the question. Um, can, can you clarify that? I don't know exactly what you mean by that. I think what he's asking in, in short is if a song that um, has is a standard um, that or is more well known has something that is more powerful than a song like fabulous where it's maybe it's lyrics a song like uh, yeah that, I don't well I mean there you know there's popular songs I mean especially in the early jazz stage you know so many of the songs were Tin Pan Alley and Broadway and songs that were standards that jazz musicians took and made it into their own and a lot of songs, you know, especially in jazz, are instrumental. If you really look at it, there's, you know, it wasn't until later on, like say maybe in the 40s and 50s, where singers got more prevalent. So in the old days, you'd had mostly instrumental, and then you might have a singer come and sing a couple songs. By the 50s, you'd have singers, and then maybe they'd have solos in the middle of their songs. So things kind of changed. And, you know, people in general, 
relate to lyrics? Because, you know, not many people know really what's going on in jazz. I mean, a lot of people, I've seen people that have no idea that the chord changes of the song keep going, you know, after the melody, because they just think you play the melody. And then after that, all of a sudden, you just kind of play free. And a lot of people don't know the difference between a trumpet and, a, you know, a bugler and a coronet, or let alone a, tromp, a trombone or a saxophone. So I guess that's, Taking, taking steps to really kind of push and tell the story. We're going to look really quickly at the blues coming up because in a lot of ways, some of the things that were happening, especially to black Americans, weren't really known in the media because they weren't covered as much. And when we get to the blues, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So, um, and you can also hear that instrumental music moves the spirit through sound and expression, okay? But the lyrics, you know, especially on the Charles uh, Mingus part the music musical instrumental part was great but it didn't carry the weight you would have no idea what that song was really written about until you heard him sing it okay and then you have great you know emotional songs say for instance like alabama you know which was written you know about the horrific uh four girls, you know, they got killed in Birmingham, Alabama, you know, in, in um, the 1963. And then, so John Coltrane in 1964 releases Alabama. I'll just play a second of it, but it's just such a beautiful composition and you can feel the pain in the way he plays it. I hate to cut that off because the song is really long. I mean, I can't play the whole thing. We didn't even get to the melody, but you can hear the, you can hear the pain to, and I can, I can feel that. I mean, to me, one of the things I loved about John Coltrane was his sound and just, you could feel something coming through him because to, to, you know, if you look at John Coltrane's life, he was trying to be like Einstein. You know, he was trying to solve the world's problems through sound. He was such a brilliant and emotional player. So that, that's something to check out if, you, if you're unfamiliar with that song. Let me keep going here. Here's a couple other things. Max Roach did a thing called We Insist the Freedom Now Suite back in 1960, talking about civil rights. And here's, I won't play the, either of these because they don't have time, but Search for the New Land by Lee Morgan was a very, it's about 11 minutes long. It's a very uplifting piece. So some compositions, you know, had sadness, some had anger, some had sort of hope. Um, so music can serve a lot of different emotions. It's just not theory. It's just not the notes. It's, it's what you do with the notes. Okay. So like I'm just saying, some music can be an uplifting and empowering. So there's a song called Lift Every Voice and Sing, which some people have called the black, uh, could be the black national anthem. I'll just play a second of this. So again, I have to hate to cut it short, but if you go back and look at these lyrics, these lyrics are filled with hope. They're, they're about empowering people. And I know just from my standpoint, even from touring, for instance, I might be exhausted. We might be somewhere in Europe with the Pat Metheny group and I'm just like sick and I'm just tired. And I put on some music and by the time a song or a, 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 an album is done, I'm ready to play. I'm ready to go out. It, it, it's, it gives you strength that other, you know, other idioms might not do the same way. 
there's other songs that are great. Like, you know, you have All You Need Is Love by the Beatles. I'm, I'm sure you all know that. That's all about, and some people thought that this was kind of just, you know, all oh, the Beatles were lightweight and they're just singing about love. They actually kind of got busted for some of this. And to me, they were just trying to be a positive figure because some of their songs are, you know, about reality. Some of them are darker. Some of them, um, A Day in the Life is actually just things taken from a newspaper that, that John Lennon just kind of cut in. So there's, there's so many ways to tell different stories. Uh, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. I mean, so you, you have this, I'll play it just a second of this. So, and that's over 50 years ago. So pretty interesting, huh? And a lot of the music I'll be playing is from actually 50 years ago, from either 70 or 69. And some things have changed and some haven't. Uh, this is a positive song, uh, Get Together by the Young Bloods. They don't have time to play that. Um, now, here's the thing I was going to talk about blues music, because a lot of the a lot of the blues music talked about things that the white media didn't really want to cover. So if you're really interested in this, there's a great resource called the Uncensored History of the Blues. It's got 71 uh, podcasts. They're all about a half hour long. And all of them are, are um, about and contain songs from the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. So pre-World War II. So look at all these different me uh, things they're talking about. They're talking about, I mean, even the Furniture Man blues, when, you know, so the Furniture Man would come and repossess your uh, furniture because you couldn't pay for it. There's also really, you know, there's lesbian blues, the um, inadequacy blues, um, drinking canned heat and Jake, talking about like, you know, canned heat and sternos, like a thing that, you know, hobos and poor people would, would cook their food over, but it contained alcohol, so you would drink it. There's so, that show is so interesting. I've downloaded all 71 podcasts. It's by a guy named Mike Rugel. Uh, so that's something definitely to check out. And then folk music. Okay, so folk music, a lot of times you think, okay, well, um, it's just, you know, it's it's people playing on guitars, you know, acoustic guitars, and until obviously Bob Dylan in, in 1965 at the Newport Folk Festival electrified it. He took the big chance, and he was actually almost booed off the stage. But he he decided that he was going to move folk for uh, music forward. But like this tune alone, I mean, the times there are changing. I mean, I'll just play a little bit of this. <laughs> So Bob Dylan was this amazing uh, composer. I mean, influenced the Beatles, influenced Jimi Hendrix. And it's funny because when, he, when this stuff came out, I was only like 10, 11 years old. So it's funny because his voice sounded funny back then to me, but it's not about his voice. It's about the message and, and the way he put it out there. And so he had such a big influence and, and it's so forward thinking. And, and so there were definitely some other folk artists out there, like, um, like, like this, for instance, some songs that protested war. So like uh, Draft Dodger Rag. 
by Phil Oakes. So Phil Oakes had something interesting to say. He said, even though you can't expect to defeat the absurdity of the world, you must make that attempt. That's morality, that's religion, that's art, that's life. And so you start looking at that and, you know, what is our purpose? So to play instrumental music is fantastic. And if you can actually move people one way or the other through what you play on your instrument, it's great. But also I've always loved lyrics because to me, you know, it's poetry with melody and harmony. It's not just the words. Now here's a song that moved me back then, Fortunate Son. So that's, that tune had a lot to do. And John Fogarty talks about it because he was actually, you know, in the service and um, he made that point, you know, that some people were going to war and a lot of times they were the poorer people and then the rich people and people that were, you know, connected didn't go and didn't serve, even though they were the ones to wave the flag. Okay. And then you've got songs like War by Edwin Starr, which was, you know, a big hit, hit on the radio. Um, okay, so let me keep going. So then you have music that breaks down barriers and norms. So for instance, when Jimi Hendrix played the Star Spangled Banner at Woodstock in 1969, he really got a lot of flack for that because people thought he was disregarding the, um, the, you know, the, the national anthem because most people sang it straight. And now everybody plays it differently because he kind of opened up that whole door. I don't know if I need to play uh, this much, but So you, so you hear that, and to some people it sounded like noise, but he's actually trying to sound like napalm bombs and guns going off because, you know, he, he was, um, what, he was in the uh, military as well. So he kind of saw all these things. So let me keep going here. So then norms that break down things like I'm not going to play some of this because I don't know, you know, there's some profanity in some of these things kind of coming up. So I'm not going to go there because I'm not sure who else is out there. But when country Joe and the fish at Woodstock saying I feel like I'm fixing to die. He opened up, you know, the F word. And then this song we can be together by the Jefferson airplane, which is one of my favorite songs. I mean, I don't know how they got this on uh, RCA Victor, but they say the F word and they say the MF word. And that was huge. And then they went on the Dick Cavett show and they were the first people to say those words on television while they were performing. So here they are, they're breaking down norms. And, you know, because I know at this particular time, you know, if anybody remembers the Dick Van Dyke show, I mean, the, um, Dick Van Dyke and Laura Petrie, his wife, played by Mary Tyler Moore, they lived, they slept in separate beds. Mary Tyler Moore was only able to wear slacks on a, on a certain number of episodes. You know, I Dream of Jeannie with Barbara Eden. She wasn't even allowed to show her belly button. So these things were really radical 50 years ago. Now, you know, you can turn on HBO or you can turn on Netflix and all these things are taken just for granted. But some people had to break down these walls and they did. Okay, now here's one, a song, this song changed the voting age. I'll just play you a second of it and then I'll show you what it's about. <laughs> Now, 
Now this next line, check this out. Okay, so there, that song helped get in the 26th Amendment that allowed um, people to vote that were 18 years because that line, you're old enough to kill but not for voting, changed Congress. And it's funny, if you, if you read what it says there, it said in 1972, the first year that they were eligible, only uh, half of the 18, 19, 20 year olds uh, bothered to even vote which was a big surprise. But at least that changed, changed the way, you know, voting rights were, were happening, just that song. Even a lot of people thought that song was, you know, ah, oh, he doesn't sound that good or whatever, you know, I love it. It's a fantastic song. And the performance is, is passionate enough that it, it moved mountains, okay? A few songs that moved me. So here's me right now, no, nah. It's not, this is me in the early 70s. And let I me mean, play a couple songs that kind of move me. I don't know if I'm gonna run out of time, but one thing I have to tell you a story is about the time when I looked like this, I was on the road with a, a band, the Adrian Smith Group, and we were opening for the Electric Light Orchestra in Oklahoma City. And so we did our sound check and then I jammed with them and they, they were telling me they love my playing and everything. I was in heaven and I went across the street before our show to a cafeteria and they refused to serve me because of the way I looked. And I went back to, to, uh, you know, to the auditorium and I realized that I could just go and cut my hair and in five minutes I could go back and they would serve me. And it made me realize that if you're black or if you're, you know, if you're somebody that they don't like because of the way you look that you can't change the color of your skin, you would not allow to be do that. So that was really kind of one of the enlightening things to me. So here's one of the great songs by Frank Zappa. I know the lyrics by heart. I'm not going to be able to play the whole thing because I want to play some things that I'm on. But um, I Am the Slime is one of the great um, sort of statements on what television is. <laughs> Check these lyrics out, they're amazing. I mean, that's, to me, that's just unbelievable. Now, here's another song. I'm not going to be able to play this, but this was a song called Mr. You're a Better Man Than I that I absolutely love the lyrics. And Manford Mann was this band that had hits like Quinn the es Eskimo and Do Wah Diddy, but he was a jazz player. And so he 
quit the whole pop kind of scenario and formed like an almost an avant-garde jazz band called Chap um, Manfred Mann Chapter 3. Well worth checking out. And this song was written by uh, the old drummer who became the singer and, and keyboard player, uh, Mike Hugh. And it was actually recorded earlier by the Yardbirds, the, the great British blues band, but they played it much faster, which made me really realize that some of this stuff is about like the tempo of things too. Let, I, I'll just play you a second of this, I guess. Let me skip ahead here. I mean, there's three uh, verses on this and they're all just stunning and they made a big impact on me. Now here's another band, the MC5, which was, they never really made any money, but they were a radical band. I always loved this song. Um, let me play a part of this because this had, had a bearing on me too. And I remember when this came out, uh, my girlfriend at the time, her father hated this idea of the American ruse. He thought it was, you know, sort of anti-American, but it, the lyrics really are kind of apropos, uh, even now in, in some ways. So you've got that. Oh my gosh, we're, we're running out of time because I want to play a number of things. The, all these things I'm kind of racing through had a big sort of impact on, on my life. And um, let me get to some of the things that I was actually privileged to be on, if you don't mind. How are we doing, Christy? We're doing great with questions. I think everyone's rooting for you to have another future session, Paul. Because really? Are you enjoying so this, much. everyone? Yes, and we totally recognize there's so much to cover, so perhaps we'll have to schedule another future session. Yeah, everyone's rooting for more, Paul. <laughs> can I play? Can I play you what, the the tune my wife my wife just wrote, and we just recorded this yesterday. Yes, let me play please. this whole tune because this is this was based, uh, you know, on the the killing at the Tree of Life synagogue, and um, her rabbi. And her wrote the lyrics to this, even though he's deceased now, and, and she wrote the music. And, and I, so I'm on percussion on the second uh, verse, and we added my friend who's a guitar player in Russia. And we just did this. We just mixed this yesterday. So let me play this. I'm not going to play the whole thing because I'm so proud of this song, okay? And then we'll, we can talk a little bit afterwards.
So, hi everyone. I hope you like that song. Yes, absolutely beautiful. Nothing but praise in the comments. Um, so moving, very moving. Um, and can, um, Paul, we did have a few questions coming. Sure, let's talk. If you want to turn, Joyce, if you, your question, um, it was pretty lengthy. If you want to unmute your mic and go ahead and ask, I think that'd be perfectly fine. Hi, hey Paul, that was great so far. And please do more and for longer periods of time because <laughs> well, it's really interesting. It's, you know, but were you familiar with some, did it, was it enlightening for some people that didn't know the facts behind some of these songs? Absolutely. I, I Great. think so. So I have some questions for sure. you. Okay. Um, the first one, well, a, a, a couple. Okay. So the first one is um, in the old days, it was a badge of honor to not sell your music out to corporations mm -hmm. you know because music was political and it was meant to not be capitalistic and mm -hmm. and and there's an antithesis of that right so now the times have changed and and what i see is performers instantly selling while their songs are really hot to every possible corporation they can to promote everything from cars to Coca-Cola to right. McDonald's to everything else. So I, I wanted to hear your comments on that. And then I have another question. Well, you know, I just remember when all of a sudden a lot of the songs started being using being used in commercials, especially starting, I think, in the 70s and 80s. And to me, you know, when I hear a song you get an image and when you see a video of it that might not be the image that you associate with your personal feelings about the song but then when you see it as selling a product it just takes the wind out of your sails to me you know all of a sudden something that was meant like i was talking about even my generation by the who that was a pretty you know that was you know that was a tough song and then all of a sudden it's selling something but unfortunately now for musicians i mean it's it's harder to make a living i mean Everything is streamed. I mean, people now, you know, with Spotify, the guy that owns Spotify just put up something about a week or two ago that the musicians were so ticked off at because he was saying, well, you know, the old model is that you could do a, an album every couple of years, but now you have to do two albums at least every year. So he was talking about just 
you know, just cranking it out. And he's like worth a couple billion dollars and he doesn't even play music. He never doesn't play an instrument. So, you know, it's been sort of, I don't know, the wind has been taken out of the sails a lot of ways because a lot of kids don't have CD players anymore. Vinyls sort of come back to some degree, but um, it's really hard. So if you're getting like 0 0.00, six cents or something you know you're going to have to sell thousands and thousands of streams to be able to even make any money at all so i think some people are just doing it because of the licensing that's a way to make income except you know i've been on the board um of uh, the recording academy for five terms and there was one seminar where they were talking about in the old days you know if you're rec say if a song got used on a commercial, you could make $100,000 easily. Now there's so many people vying to get their com uh, songs and commercials and movies that, you know, if you get $2,500, then that's probably okay, you know? So they've really kind of, you know, because there's so much product out there. And now the way it is, I mean, in the old days, you had to go into a recording studio and the recording engineer was, um, you know, he was an expert at what he did. The room was tuned towards music, everything. It cost money to do it. Now everyone's, you know, on iTunes, and I mean, uh, on GarageBand and just putting this stuff out. So there's kind of a glut of, of, uh, of music too. So some of it's great, but it also if people don't really care about it, as, even the quality, I mean, an MP3 versus a wave, a wave is uh, CD quality. MP3s are compressed. So all this stuff that musicians worry about, like when they're mixing and mastering their record, by the time it gets on a, on a MP3, it gets squashed. And then people are listening to this, those little white earbuds and, you know, everything is kind of changed. So it really is kind of sad in some ways, but that's things are, are you know, that's progress, I guess, for better or for worse. So we, you know, to stay in the business, we have to learn how to still do what we do. And there's going to be people that are going to figure out better ways to do it. I mean, in the old days, when radio came out, the people were worried about that sheet music wasn't going to be available anymore, you know, so this progress is always scary for people. But hopefully, there'll be a way that uh, musicians will be able to you know, make a good living or just or at least make a living doing what they really love to do. You're, you're still muted, Joyce. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to ask is, could you please comment on the fact that uh, Donald Trump has been using music by Neil Young and the Stones against mm -hmm. their will Mm -hmm. with them even threatening him with a lawsuit and yet he still uses their music when he is the opposite of what their music is intended for and that he's kind of getting away with it so that's a question and then one other thing well um, don't, has, don't, don't, okay let me answer that one first yeah so, okay no i mean that's that's horrible but you know in the old days when you had oh well what, what there was a, a car made by ford it wasn't a maverick i forgot what car it was but when it was hit from back, the gas tanks would explode often. And they knew about it, you know, and they just weighed the the price of not fixing it versus the, the lawsuits that they were going to get. So sometimes that's what people do. They can, they, you know, if you have the money to get away with stuff, it's like, you'll just you'll just kind of push it back and push it back. So I, yeah, it's horrible. I, I just saw Neil Young, you know, talking about he's trying to sue, but you know, it, by the time the damage is done. And for people that don't know that he, him and the Stones don't want him to use those songs, th they think, oh, those are great songs. I, they, they must be supporting him. It's, it's crazy. And then the other thing was, um, uh, have, did you ever notice that This Is Not America when you were working with Pat, that that song, uh, that people might either really be grateful for it or be offended by it in any way? because they thought it might be uh, incendiary in any way? Well, I mean, there's a great video I was gonna show uh, that someone made on YouTube with the George Floyd protests. And it still seems, I mean, even though that was done in like, you know, uh, the Falcon and the Snowman came out in 1985. So, you know, we're talking about 35 years ago. A lot of this stuff is, is still the same. And yeah, you're always going to offend people. I mean, one of the things I tell my students about even their musical style, if they want to, if they want to make everybody happy, it's not going to work because people will like you and someone will hate you for the very same reason. 
<laughs> so you've got to please yourself. You really, you can't worry about what people think. You know, if you can honestly look at what you're doing and believe that, that that's what you're going to do. Because, you know, I, I've talked to so many famous musicians. I mean, um, I can tell you a funny story. There's a really famous bass player that I played with, um, jazz bass player. And I was on the road with him once and we were getting along great. And all of a sudden he, I had my CDs with me. We were like in Austria and um, he said, Oh, what do you listen to? And half of them were jazz, half of them were rock. And so um, he looked at, the, I had the Beatles number one, you know, the, the, the hits. And he goes, oh, so what, and I said, yeah, I like Paul McCartney's bass playing. And he goes, oh, pick me out something you think is good. So I picked out Paperback Rider, because that was the only one that was in that thing that really I thought would be a good example. So he puts on the headphones and he listens to the whole thing. And he looks at me afterwards and, and, he, and he goes, don't ever play that crap for me again. He didn't use the word crap. And then after that, we were never the same. After that, he kind of looked at me in a different way, wow. you know? And and so I've always been open to everything. I mean, even as a kid, I had jazz records, rock records, ethnic records. You know, I'd listen to Buddhist monks and mu music from Chile. At the same time, I'm listening to the Beatles and John Coltrane. And so I, you know, I am all these different things. So I've never really worried about what people thought about me. It's just, you know. Not, not so much what people think, you know, that you're worried about it, but more like what kind of response would somebody give not that you would care that they felt that way but did people look at things as controversial or as something um, no i, I of never recognition of recognition you know? i never had anybody come up to me and think that that was a negative song you know everybody was impressed that it was david bowie you know for one thing that i record with david bowie and and the, the movie was a great movie it was you know john schlesinger is the director that also did midnight cowboy and so you know you have sean penn and is in there, look what Sean Penn's doing. I mean, he's doing all these amazing things with getting testing done. So again, you know, like the band Earwax Control that I was in, you know, for all these years. I mean, we, we were a really pretty hardcore band. I mean, everything was improvised and we were very sacrilegious as far as music, you know, we'd play anything. And I didn't really worry about it. You know, so some people would look at me and they go like, well, even, even when I got the gig with Pat, I mean, you know, a lot of people thought that, wow, you know, I was more like a freer player. And then later on, when I played with this guy, Charles Gale, who was an avant-garde sax player from New York, people were hiring, people were going, why did they, he hire Paul? He plays with Pat Metheny. So my brand had gotten completely switched around 180 degrees. So that just happens sometimes. And, you know, you can't worry about it. I mean, there, you know, sometimes you can get typecast, which can affect your work a lot. Sometimes they say, please don't call me just a jazz musician because I play all kinds of music. You know, I love jazz, but to me, it's also about, I just love music and you know, I'll play anything and try, you know, to me, you know, some people think country, country Western is bad music. No, then George Jones and Don Williams, there's some great country Western people too. So it's keeping an open mind and then looking deeper than just the surface of things and not being affected by what other people think. I, I really don't think, I mean, like even when you teach somebody, you know, you try to unlock their, you know, unlock their door, with, you know, with the key, you think that the, the things you're going to tell them are going to help them. But you know, I also think that sometimes they have to look at what I say to and, and filter it to what they think they need. So that's the thing. It's, it's a growing process. And I think that's part of our reason for being on this planet is to actually, you know, grow as, as a human. Anybody else have any questions too? Oh, thank you. Oh my gosh. As we wrap up, um, and thank you so much for joining us. I also want to point out that we have Marsha Goldstein, who's a Roosevelt trustee board member here joining us today. So Marsha, thanks for joining us. Oh, wait, yes. I'm here because I'm an alumni and because I am because of the Chicago College of Performing Arts. Trustee comes is, is important, but it's part of a much bigger Roosevelt history for me. Yeah, absolutely. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Paul. That was, that was brilliant. Thank you, Marcia. Thanks for all you do for our school, too, really. You know, again, you know, it's, it's, that's the thing, you know, everyone, if we got along, we could all help each other rise. You know, that's the idea. That's the thing that drives me crazy is there's so much of this now. And, and when you do this, I mean, it doesn't really work. It just ends up being frustrating, you know, and 
I just think that's the one thing is, is that we have to make this world a better place. It sounds stupid. It sounds cliche, but that's, I mean, it, what's the option if, if if we're just gonna you know if we don't if we don't take advantage of what we know what we can do to help I mean that's just our mission so thank you everybody for coming out and, and spending time with me do it again thank you Paul I will I will okay so if, you're, if you're up for it and there is um, another uh, op opportunity to to join uh, again for you leading a session um, Michael Mallow wants to know what's the next topic going to be. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, I, <laughs> I don't well, know. Do you, does anybody want to know something from me? I could do a topic on, on what people want to know too. Absolutely. And we will be sending out a survey to everyone who joined us. So if you have okay. any recommendations, we can certainly collect that. Um, Great. We're, we're hearing, we're, I'm seeing head shakes and yeses. So thank you again so much, Paul, for sharing. Um, always you know that m music has, has influenced society over time, can influence, we really appreciate it. And I think all of us, um, like one deep bow to you for, uh, for giving us a little bit of your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe. Yes, absolutely. Thanks, See you everyone. next time. Okay. Bye. Bye.